I'm going to invite you to take a seat and to grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 2 is where we're going to be today. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you and turn to page 1117 and you will find Romans chapter 2, our text. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one of these with you. We want you to have the Word of God. We want you to read the Word of God because we know if you do that, God will change your life. Uh, so this morning, let me start off with a question. Who are you? I mean, really, who are you? Because all of us have an identity, and all of us uh, want people to know who we are. So I'm going to ask you to do something. Uh, and some of you will love this, some of you will hate this, but I'm going to ask you to do it anyway. Uh, I want you to take just a moment, and I want you to introduce yourself to someone around you. Uh, preferably somebody who doesn't know you perfectly already, you know. But, uh, but you, if, you're gonna, if you're only comfortable doing this with your spouse or your family, that's fine. But I want you to introduce yourself using only five words. Or if you can't do a word, use a short phrase, you know. Uh, but five words sh or short phrases introducing yourself. You ready? Set, go. Well, I got to say, this service had a lot more fun doing this than any others. I don't know if it's because you guys already had your coffee or you're awake or, or what, but, or is this the ADD service? And so you guys just like really, really love it. Hey, so was that easy to do? Okay, some yeses, some noes. Uh, all the extroverts are like, yes, can we do it again? I want to meet more people. I've already got three lunches scheduled, and, uh, and others of you are like, uh, no, we don't ever want to do that again. Don't ask us. But see, we've all got an identity, and, and it matters uh, to us, and, and we all have to identify who we are. Sometimes uh, some of our local public servants want me to identify myself along with my registration and proof of insurance, and, uh, you know, and so I've got to produce a card that has my identification on it. And if you're going to fly any place, then you've got to produce a, you know, a, a license or a passport so you can get on the plane. And, uh, and so our identity is really important to us. Uh, and in fact, the Arizona Department of Transportation sent me a letter this week telling me that the photo on my license had expired. And, and I don't ever look at the photo on my license because I know who it is, right? And so I pulled out, looked at it, and I went, wow, I am a lot older than that guy is. <laughs> Maybe if you guys didn't give us licenses for 30 years, we wouldn't have our photos expire. And then I started thinking, wow, uh, you know, for something that identifies who we are, we lie a lot on these things, <laughs> don't we? I mean, your name is your name, and you probably you got your birth date right. But um, then they ask those other questions like height. I'm not going to ask you to confess, but I'm pretty sure that a lot of you added an inch or two because you didn't want to be that short or you wanted to be a little bit taller. This is the height I want to be uh, when I grow up. Uh, and then there's that other question that's so rude, right? How much do you weigh? Right. I, I'm, I, you know, I'm not going to say everybody in here lies about that. But most of us lie about that, right? Because you put on the, yeah, everybody subtracts 10 pounds for good intentions, right? Because you're going to be like, yes, yeah, this is the weight that I should be. This is my goal weight. I'm going to put that on there because that's what I'm going to be in six months. Uh, or, or, you know, maybe you just do 20 pounds less because you're in denial. And, uh, you know, or you can be a real creative liar and have the officer go, I don't think this is you. Uh, but see, our identity matters. Who are you really? The Apostle Paul uh, kind of delves into this subject in our passage today. We're looking at Romans chapter 2, verses 17 through 29. And some of you who are with us every week are going to go, hey, hey, you skipped the first half of the chapter, and, and you're right. 
Uh, we did, we're going to do this chapter out of order because next weekend is family weekend and the older kids, the ones that you checked in in a student wing, are going to be in here with you. The younger kids are still going to be able to be checked in in the early childhood wing. But um, as the calendar fell, the passage, uh, the, the one we're looking at today that we should have looked at next week, has a lot of conversation about circumcision in it. And I didn't want to do that to you parents, you know? I didn't want your eight-year-old daughters going, Daddy, what circumcision? <laughs> So you can thank me for that later, uh, but uh, I just kind of figured it would be less awkward if we dealt with this this week and went back and covered the first half next week. So the Apostle Paul is writing, and he's writing to the church, to Christians in Rome, and he says this, beginning in verse 17, but if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law. And if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of the children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then, who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law, for as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. For circumcision is indeed a value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Now, this is a kind of an intense and con, you know, somewhat confusing passage until you understand that Paul is, is writing about two themes specifically. Two themes. The first one of those is the theme of identity. You notice this early on when he's talking about the Jewish identity. Uh, and there's lots of references to the Jewish identity and the physical representation of that identity. You received the law, you've been circumcised, because that was the mark of belonging to the people of God. So he's talking about identity, this physical identity. Now, that's not the only reason he's talking about this, all these Jewish forms of identity. He's talking about this partly because uh, our heritage as Christians is in Judaism. Christianity was born out of the Jewish faith. And, and so, uh, you know, you've ever heard of the Judeo-Christian ethic? It's because we share the same foundation. Uh, in fact, we share sacred texts. What we call the Old Testament or the Old Covenant is what they call the Covenant or the Testament. So half of our sacred scriptures are shared by uh, those of Jewish faith. And just for the record, in case you hadn't noticed this, Jesus was Jewish. In fact, uh, pretty much everybody in the early church was Jewish. All the apostles, they were Jewish. Paul, who's writing this, is Jewish. And, and so uh, it's born out of Judaism. Now that's part of the reason. The other reason that he's referencing all this about Judaism and the identity of Jews is because of Paul's nemesis. There was a group of former Pharisees who had become believers in Jesus Christ who followed Paul around corrupting or perverting his teaching. Uh, historians call this group of, of people Judaizers because they were, they were former uh, uh, you know, Pharisees who had believed in Jesus, but they believed that everybody who was going to follow Jesus had to convert to Judaism first. So if you were a male and you wanted to believe in Jesus, uh, you had to become a Jew, you had to get circumcised, and then you had to follow the food laws and the holidays and all that kind of stuff. And so this was a big deal because these people were, were pretty much saying, hey, you, you can't believe in Jesus unless you become a Jew. Now, uh, after the, Paul's first missionary journey where thousands of Gentiles became followers of Jesus, it, this was a crisis in the early church. And they came back to Jerusalem and, and he went before the apostles and the Judaizers went before the apostles and they had this big debate and the apostles took it under consideration. 
And they came back united in their decision. You can read this in Acts chapter 15. And they said, hey guys, we prayed about this. We were with Jesus. And here's what we determined. And that is it is faith in Jesus Christ alone that gives you salvation. It is nothing that you do. It's not following the law because we got the law, but we can't follow it. It is believing in Jesus and him only that provides salvation. So Paul went back out on his missionary journeys and these Judaizers went following him, trying to corrupt the churches that he started. So he's writing to the Roman church about this identity in Christ. And Paul tells us that internal and external identities are both real. Internal and external identities are real. All of us have both a public image or a public persona, and then we have that inner self. Sometimes people call that your true self, right? Your public uh, identity is, is how others see us, and, and really, in part, how we want other people to see us. So it's how we describe uh, our, our, you know, what we do, who we are, uh, kind of what you did just a moment ago with your introducing yourself with five words. I don't know what words you used, but, you know, it's a lot of times it's about our relationship status. It's about our family. It's about our career. It's about where we live. It's about how we live. Basically, it's your Facebook profile, right? Because you present a life on Facebook that you want people to believe is your life. Maybe it is and maybe it isn't, but that's what you want people to believe. So your public persona is how we identify ourselves and how others see us. But we also have our internal selves. Who are you when you're all alone? When it's just you and God and nobody else is watching? Who are you then? What do you see when you look in the mirror? Who do you see when you look in the mirror? You see, sometimes the external and internal identities are in sync, and sometimes they're radically different. So Paul asks the question, basically, are you seeking the approval of people or the affirmation of God? Are you living for that external uh, response from the people around you? Are you focused on the internal response or affirmation of God? At the end of this uh, chapter, or, uh, Paul said, uh, for they have received his praise is not from man, but from God. He says, it's, 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 I'm not worried about the applause of men. I'm worried about the affirmation of God. So are you living with the focus on the external, about what others think about you? Or are you focused on the internal, what God thinks about you? Which one is your life trying to please? Now, the Apostle Paul uh, understood this battle that we all face about those two different identities. He wrote about this in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. And this is one of those life verses I'd encourage for you. Paul says, For am I now seeking the approval of men or of God, or am I still trying to please men? If I'm still trying to please men, I am no longer a servant of Christ. He says it's all about serving God. And he understood that whole external life because Paul was a Pharisee. Paul had lived his life for the approval of others and he rose in esteem and and he was a high-ranking official and he had a lot of authority and a lot of respect. And he says in Philippians chapter 3 that basically I trashed all of that for the sake of knowing Jesus. He says that's what's important. For me personally, I'm just going to share this. I love you guys and, and I want God to bless you. I want you to be happy. I want you to like me back, Okay. I just said it. You know, I love it when you guys actually, lo- you know, love Calvary. I love it when you, you know, commend the sermons and all that kind of stuff. But here's the reality. Uh, the only one I'm living to please is Jesus. I had to apologize to my wife last night because she was here when I said that. And, and, uh, and, and I believe happy wife, happy life, okay? Uh, so I, I practice that. But honestly, if it comes down between Jesus and Meralda, Meralda loses, Because I'm a servant of Christ. The internal matters more than the external. And, and, and if you're like me, you've watched so many people in church living for the approval of others, living for the applause of people, uh, wanting that affirmation or that recognition for their good deeds and their serving, or maybe even their financial gifts. In fact, some stewardship uh, fundraising programs try to manipulate this by, by actually recommending that you put people's names in public places, right? Like there's a wall outside where you put your names on because you give. 
or some places, you know, you can sponsor a, a pew or a chair. Somebody actually suggested that. Hey, pastor, you can raise more money if you let people buy a chair. And I was like, no! Can you imagine if people actually had their name on a chair? That's my chair. It's got my name on it. I mean, I'm praying that people sit in your seats anyway, but if it's got your name on it, what am I going to do? No, I mean, you know, people are like, yeah, we could. I've been in beautiful churches that had these incredible stained glass windows, and I walked over to them to look at them like, wow, that is gorgeous. And then you go, oh, it's got somebody's name on it. How hideous. So we don't do that here at Calvary. We're not putting your name anyplace. Now, then I thought, I, I'm going to say that, and somebody's going to test my convictions. I just want you to know it's going to take eight figures to test those convictions. <laughs> okay? I'm willing to be tested, so uh, go ahead and try. And, and then, because I'm evil, I thought, well, if we're going to put people's names someplace, where would we put them? I think we could dedicate a urinal to you. <laughs> Maybe a toilet. You know, it just kind of fits that way. I, I don't know. I, like I said, I'm kind of evil, but, but oh, living for others' approval is empty. I mean, it's, it's joyless. It's unsatisfying. Ultimately, it's idolatry. The external identity is ultimately meaningless. Uh, listen to Paul again in this text at the end, 28 and 29. And because uh, I, I want us to get this. We need to understand this. He says, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. Tell that to the people who went through it as adults. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. Let me read this again with a little bit of a twist. For no one is a Christian who is merely one outwardly, nor is baptism outward and physical. But a Christian is one inwardly, and baptism is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. I have to ask this question then. Has God changed your heart? Has God changed your heart? Really, you should ask yourself that question. Has God changed my heart? Because that's what matters. That's what Paul's talking about. It's not about the, the show. It's not about what you're doing for other people to see. And, and he doesn't want us to play a game and, and try to lean on our heritage or lean on what other people think about us. It really is about has the Holy Spirit of God claimed you as one of the people of God? Because he's writing to people who are trying to lean on their heritage as making them more spiritual than other people. And he says, your heritage has nothing to do with it. Your external actions have nothing to do with it. So if you're coming here and, and, and you're going through the motions and you're trying to be good and you're hoping that your good deeds are going to get you into heaven, then, then you've got to be crazy frustrated. And I'm just going to encourage you to ask God to change your heart. Now, there's a lot of times that I wish I could see your heart, but I can't see your heart. I don't know what's going on in the inside. I can see the externals. I can hear you confess Jesus as Lord. I can celebrate your baptism. I can watch you serve or, or give or do all those kinds of things. But I don't know what's real inside of you. That's you and God territory. By the way, that's why people shouldn't judge one another because you can't see somebody's heart. Only God can. So if you're judging people, you're playing God. That's idolatry too. But if you're sitting here and you don't know that God has changed your heart, because I'm just going to tell you, I know God's changed my heart. I know what kind of a loser, failure uh, person I was and how God has changed me from that. Okay, I can identify life change. And, and since Calvary is all about leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus, has that happened in your life? If it hasn't, then stop playing the games. Those, those are frustrating. Those are joyless. And, and today, just surrender. Just ask Jesus to change you. Tell him you need that heart of flesh instead of that heart of stone. He will do that in your life. So the first theme that Paul talks about is identity. Who are we? The second theme that he talks about is integrity. Integrity. Uh, once you are certain that you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, Savior of the world, he was crucified for your sins, was raised from the dead, you've made a commitment to follow Jesus. Then we've got to wrestle with how are we going to represent Jesus? How are we going to live out that identity with integrity? 
because we are called, we are challenged to practice what we preach. Look at verses 21 through 24 again. Because again, he's talking to people who are boasting about their relationship with God. And he says, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law, for as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And, and, and understand, the Jewish people are God's chosen people, and they were chosen to be a light to the nations, to tell the nations about the reality of God, and they failed in that. They gloried in their relationship with God and their status as his chosen people, but they dropped the ball on the mission. And God has given us the mission. Are we dropping the ball? Because integrity is essential because hypocrisy damages the kingdom of God. We know this. I mean, it's not just intuitive to us. We experience it, right? I hope you guys are inviting your friends to church, okay? And I know a lot of you are, so I appreciate that. But here's the deal. You go and have this conversation with people. And you say, hey, why don't you come to church with me? And a lot of people, their first statement back is, I don't want to go to church. Church is full of hypocrites. hypocrites. Right. And I used to argue with them, but now I just agree. <laughs> yeah, it is. But are you going to let other people keep you from a life-changing relationship with God? Are you going to let other people keep you from experiencing the love and the grace of Jesus? He can change you. Don't worry about other people. So, uh, but we know that hypocrisy damages the kingdom of God. Mahatma Gandhi, one of the most influential men in the 20th century, said, if it were just based on the teachings of Jesus, I would be a Christian. The problem is, I know Christians. You see, when we say or profess one thing and live another, we push people away from Jesus. That's why character is one of our core values here at Calvary. We believe you cannot represent Jesus unless you reflect his character. And we get in trouble when we try. So when we say one thing, when we profess one thing and we live another, we push people away from Jesus. In our homes, in our families, we push them away from Jesus. In in our places of business, at school, in the community. Look, no matter what you believe, you're either going to be a person of integrity or a person of hypocrisy. And God calls us to a life of integrity. And since most of us in this room profess to be followers of Jesus, let's talk about a life of biblical integrity. For us, if you're a follower, what what does it mean to live authentically out our identity as Jesus people? How are we going to do that? What do we need to do? Let me talk about some steps. And these are incredibly difficult steps. I'm not going to pretend but this is a tough passage and Paul's pretty blunt so I'm going to be blunt if you're going to live a life of biblical integrity you got to be honest with yourself be honest with yourself look again at verses 21 and 22 I know you've read this but we got to hear this Paul says you then who teach others do you not teach yourself while you preach against stealing do you steal You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? Now, the temptation is this. We want to pretend that we are good people, and therefore there are good people, us, and there are bad people who are not us. Whether us is just you by yourself or your family or your group of people or your church or whatever. And so we break people down into categories of good and bad. And and if you're a good people you excuse your bad behavior, right? We just excuse it. I mean, that's not me normally. I don't usually drink too much and act like an idiot. I don't usually flip people off in traffic, but those people deserved it. I don't usually yell at my kids like that, but, you know, they just really got on my life. We excuse our behavior. But you, you cross that line, you're a sinner. You're evil. You're bad. And the only way that we can defeat that temptation is to be brutally honest with ourselves about who we are. Uh, we're sinners. The Bible says so. I don't disagree. We're guilty. We are not good people. I, at least I know I'm not. I'm a sinner. And, and Paul points that out. He says, hey, you guys who preach against stealing, do you steal? 
Well, no, we're, we're honest people. We don't break into people's homes and take their possessions. Do you ever take anything home from the, your job without asking? Oh. What about your taxes? Are you completely honest on your taxes? Well, I'm not stealing from anybody who needs it. Sounds like justifying to me. How about goofing off while you're being paid? Anybody else ever done that? Oh, yeah, thank you for those courageous people who raise their hands. <laughs> Stealing, see, we're guilty. What, you ever, you ever been late for an appointment or just forgot about it entirely? Yeah, you stole somebody's time. They were waiting for you, and they had dedicated that time to you, and you stole it. Or how about you ever wanted something that somebody else had? You ever coveted it? Yeah, <laughs> everyone raising their hands. Uh, if you were on Main Street, you know, Thursday night when they had the boats out there, I'm pretty sure that some of you are like, that should be mine. I want that. See, we're guilty. And, and then Paul gets, you know, hits below the belt. He says, you who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Oh, no, we would never do that. We're good people. Really? Because I've been faithful to one woman my entire life, and yet I'm guilty. I'm guilty, and, I'm, and I'll just say this pretty confidently. Every guy in this room is guilty. Ladies, I'm not letting you off the hook. I just can't speak as a, as a woman what you guys think. I know what kind of pigs the men in this room are because <laughs> I'm one of them, okay? Here's the thing. Jesus said, if you even look at a woman and have evil thoughts about her, you're guilty, you're guilty of adultery. Guilty, Okay? I'm not going to ask the guys to raise their hand because I don't want to put you in that difficult spot. <laughs> and, uh, and, and besides, if you didn't raise your hands, then I'd have to preach about lying and I don't have time. So, <laughs> see, we've got to be honest with ourselves. We are not good. It, you know, when we start judging other people or calling other people bad, you know what we're like? We're like one pig calling another pig dirty. <laughs> Look at that pig over there. They're dirty. And fat. <laughs> Have you looked in the mirror? Because I'm pretty sure you qualify in the same way. So if you're going to live a life of biblical integrity, then you've got to be honest and you've got to stop pretending that you're good. Just admit that you're a mess and that you desperately need God's grace. Second step. Apply Scripture first to your life. First to your life. You who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You know that Christians are sometimes, if not always, uh, viewed as being judgmental about other people. You just ask other people, are Christians judgmental? Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times we are. And you know why we are? It's because we want other people to live by God's standards. We take the word of God and we apply it to their life and we expect people who don't believe in Jesus to live up to Jesus' standards. Um, we need to stop doing that. Hey, if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, I do not expect you to live according to the Bible. I don't expect you to live according to God's standards. Why would you? You don't believe in him. Not the way that I do. But here's the thing. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if that's your identity, Jesus expects you to live by his words. He said, if you love me, obey my commands. That's his expectations, not my expectations. That's Jesus' expectations of you. So live what you believe. Apply the Bible to your life first. Apply the Bible to your family, to your work. And maybe people will respect your life enough to ask why, to ask what you believe. Besides, it's kind of biblical anyway. Jesus said, before you try to take the speck out of your brother's eye, how about taking the log out of your own eye first? You see, when we apply Scripture first to our lives, you know what we discover? We discover how messed up we are. And, and we realize how much work God wants to do in our lives, and so we start working on us and trying to grow and become like Jesus, and we're not so worried about other people and whether they live up to those standards or not because we're worried about us because we know we don't live up to those standards. And God changes our life, and he teaches us, and he makes us new, and he renews our souls, and, and, and we become like he wants us to. 
And when you realize how much work you need in your own life, you stop making these expectations or demands of other people and you become less condemning. And that's really good. Finally, if you're going to live a life of biblical integrity, you got to live by grace. Live by grace. You see, the only hope any of us have for salvation is Jesus. The only reason we are forgiven is Jesus. We didn't do anything to get forgiven. We didn't do anything to get to heaven. It, it, it's just Jesus. We placed our faith and our trust in Jesus and what he did for us. So that's grace. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. It just is a gift that God gave. So all you can do is receive it. And here's the thing. If you receive grace, if you know that your sins are forgiven, I mean, talking about all of them, and you don't deserve it, and you know that heaven is your destiny, even though you deserve hell, it changes your attitude. You become more grateful. You become more gracious. And, and not only in your life, but it spills over on other people. It spills over on your family. You're a lot more gracious towards your spouse, towards your kids, uh, towards your friends, towards the people at work. Because you know you're getting what you don't deserve. And, and you are just rejoicing in that. And it's going to overflow. And then... You see other people differently because you realize, hey, they are just as messed up and lost as I am. And God loves them and Jesus died for them. And, and, and their life can be changed as well. And you start thinking about how you can influence them to that life-changing relationship with Jesus because you love them and you're not judging them. That's living in grace. And if we're going to be people of biblical integrity, then we've got to live by grace. So today, who are you? Are you certain of your identity in Jesus? Has he changed your life on the inside? And are you living a life of spiritual integrity, the life that Jesus calls all of his followers to live? Because the choice is yours. Let's pray.